Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, business associates, and colleagues, and many colleagues I see, a very warm welcome in beautiful Maastricht today. I wanted to say on this first spring day of the year and then say something about climate change, but it turns out to be pretty cold, so climate change not in sight. Uh, so very warm welcome. My name is Piet Eigholtz and I'm the pro-rector. That You can see that because I have this very heavy chain. That means I take the place of the rector uh, in this celebration. I'm basically the the master of ceremony on this very festive occasion. And the very festive occasion is the inaugural lecture of my dear colleague and friend, Niels Kok. And um, who's going to be officially Professor Kok today. A very big event, I think. And uh, like I said, I know him quite well. I've known him for a long time. 19 years ago, almost to the day, I rescued him from a promising career in the catering business. <laughs> and so he, 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 was, uh, he worked for uh, a catering, uh, high-level catering service called Mise en Plus. I think they're bankrupt now. And, um, and, and his, his main aim in life was to become a project leader for Mise en Plus, which is a, is, a, is a fantastic endeavor. But I saw more in him. And uh, I saw a budding scientist in this guy, especially after he, he had written his, his PhD thesis, uh, sorry, his master thesis, there was no PhD inside yet. And then I convinced him to not become a caterer, but to become a scientist. And I remember that um, we had all these econometric PhD students in the department, and they were looking at me, what is this caterer? So, in the fir so at first, they didn't really even see Niels. Then after about two or three year years, they, were start they started saying, well, he's not doing very badly for a business student. And by then, Niels had already three or four publications, and they had zero. And then gradually, Niels sort of outperformed them on almost anything that is relevant for an uh, academic career. He outperformed them on uh, the numbers of publications. I was counting this morning, we have 37 joint publications, most international in pretty good journals, I must say. We set up the Master, uh, master of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Master Center of Real Estate. Well, we, actually Niels and I just sort of looked at it and said it was great. Uh, we set up GRASP for that the same thing applies, so as companies, so also as an entrepreneur, Niels, did all these things. And, you know, I was thinking, what is Niels, what makes him so unique? And um, I'm reading currently the biography of Winston Churchill. And it's, of course, maybe a bit over the top to, to compare <laughs> uh, Niels to Winston Churchill. But in, in one way, they are really comparable. And that is in the energy that they have in the, and in the way they can energize those around them. Winston Churchill was compared to a dy uh, dynamo, a d a dynamo, how do you say, generator. And Niels is the same. It's, it's like a, it, it's this continuous source of energy that just doesn't stop. And that, Niels, that means that Niels was really already a professor 10 years ago. Because being a professor is not so much the title that you have in front of your name. It is the attitude and the work and the output that you produce. And that, that was already fantastic 10 years ago. So it's really strange that we're standing here now and not 10 years ago. Anyway, um, today it's all going to be um, it's all going to be official. And by the way, I must tell you one more thing. And that is uh, on behalf of my wife, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately. She said that I should also say, uh, talk about her very important role in uh, creating the marriage between Leon and Niels. Well, that's uh, maybe something for the reception later on. Anyway. Um, let's talk about housekeeping. Like I said, my role is to be master of ceremony. Um, and normally, Niels only gives lectures that are very interactive. But this one won't be interactive, because there will be just two people speaking in this session. That is Niels and me. And um, so no questions or nothing. Niels is just going to entertain us with his fantastic wisdom for the next three quarters of an hour. And after that, I will come back to, to give you some more housekeeping advice and um, so enjoy. Niels, you have the floor. Well, 
thank you, Pro-Rector Eichelt. Thank you, dear Pete. Normally, the kind of the praise comes after the lecture. You already gave it before, so uh, that puts on the pressure. Well, indeed, it's uh, it's almost 15 years ago uh, that I was uh, that I was standing here in uh, at the end of 2008, defending my PhD dissertation, and it's fantastic to see um, so many uh, familiar faces that were there uh, 15 years ago, but also a lot of new friends, new kids. Uh, yeah, well, new family members uh, and, uh, and new colleagues, new business associates uh, that have made it to Maastricht today. So thank you all for, uh, for coming over. People plan a property, how buildings shape the environment, your health, uh, your wealth, uh, and many more things. That's a pretty grand title uh, wh when I reread it later on, but I think it covers kind of the... the that what I want to convey pretty well, because real estate at the end of the day is where you spend most of your time. You woke up this morning, uh, likely in your own bed, in your own piece of real estate. Maybe you went to work and sat in an office or in a manufacturing facility, again, a piece of real estate. You drove down here, you're sitting in the aula, the, kind of the ad headquarters of Maastricht University, again, a fine piece of real estate. After this, a restaurant at the Pijnkazerne, more real estate, then you go to bed, either at home, or a piece of leisure real estate, a hotel. So real estate is front and center, and it's also front and center financially. This is one of the first uh, economic uh, pictures I'm gonna show you. They're kind of hard to unpack, but I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through. Uh, what I wanna show you is that your monthly mortgage payment or your monthly rent payment is a big chunk of your income. Let's first talk about how much you spend on that on average in the Netherlands. And I don't know whether you're the, whether you're the average uh, Dutchman or D Dutch women, but in Holland, on average, you're spending about 725 euros a month if you own your own home. You spend about 610 if you, uh, if you rent a home. Now, that varies throughout the life cycle. Um, in, my, uh, in my, let's say, cohort in the 35 to 45 years old, we're spending about 909 euros per month. And if you're a little older and you're renting, for example, you're spending about 612 euros a month. Now, is that a lot? or not. Let's divide this by income. And I've divided it by gross, by brutto income, so not by net in this case. Now a different picture uh, emerges. So again, the blue is rent. And what you see, if you're kind of a middle-aged renter, you, know, you spend only about 17% of your income on rent. If you're an older age renter, let's say you're above 67, might be some people above 67. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're above 67, you're spending nearly 40% of your monthly income on rent if you're a tenant. If you're a homeowner, especially when you're young, you're spending a lot. And that's because hey, you want quite a bit of home to house you and your, and your, and your kids. Uh, but also, buying a house right now is quite expensive. So again, you spend about 33% to 27% of your income in terms of mortgage. So real estate and your income are closely related, but, but it doesn't stop there. Because once you get kind of older, once you get to that 67 years old, part of your income is also gonna be determined by, by real estate, and that's through pension. I personally don't think about it a whole lot, and if you're below 67, probably also not, well, Pete may start to think about his retirement secretly, but hey, you're saving for a pension, well, I'm not, not quite, there's still a couple of, uh, couple of years to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but ultimately you'll get a pension. And pension funds invest heavily in real estate as well. And a lot of my research has focused on that. So this is a picture that is, uh, is easy, to, uh, easy to get from, from, from most of my lectures also to students. But if you look globally, about 8% of the global pension pot is invested in real estate. The global pension pot is 55 trillion US dollars. That's 55, 55 miljard. So it's a lot of money. 8% of that is invested in real estate. In the Netherlands, we invest even more in real estate as pension funds. Our total pension fund pot in the Netherlands is about 1,500 billion, so 1,500 miljard, 1.5 trillion. And 10% of that is invested in real estate. It's about 150, 150 billion. The pension fund for, uh, for us, for the professors, for the teachers, uh, ABP invests about 11%, and the pension fund for the nurses and the doctors, who I, who I know are uh, here as well, they invest about 12% in, uh, in real estate. So you see that the fluctuations in the value of real estate also affect the outcomes of pension funds and potentially their ability to increase pensions for the elderly. 
Now, if you look at where, where the elderly get their income, so again, one of those bubble charts, and you look at the above 67 age, for the homeowners, their average monthly income is about 3,200 euros. That's gross. So that's household income. But two thirds of that is derived from a pension. If you rent a home, you're slightly less dependent on a, on a pension. About 40% of your income is actually coming from, from a pension. If you're below 67, some of you may, may, uh, may get a pension already. So it's about a third of income that's derived from, uh, from a pension uh, if you own your own home and much less if you rent. So it's not just the combination between rent or mortgage payment and income, but also the fluctuations of the value uh, of real estate and the pension fund uh, portfolio that ultimately affect you financially. That's the, well, that's the wealth part. What about the environment or what about the planet? Well, this is a picture um, that I may have showed 15 years ago. I didn't go back to my slides, but it's one of my favorite slides. Uh, as you can see, I did update it to, uh, to the end of 2021. In fact, Rogier Holtemans updated it for me, so thank you, Rogier. Um, and what it shows is the role of real estate when it comes to energy consumption. The red line is real estate share of total energy consumption in the US. The US publishes better data on this than Europe. Europe is, is about the same. But in the US, buildings, both residential and commercial, consume about 40% of all energy that is consumed, natural gas, petroleum, electricity. If you look at electricity, that number is 71%. So 71% of all electricity that's consumed in the US, and just uh, by default also think Europe, is actually consumed in both homes and buildings like these, for elevators, for lighting, for computers, to charge electric cars, but also obviously for heating, cooling, and ventilation. Now, you of course knew that, and not because of the energy price that we had, let's say, until the beginning of last year. Sure, you know, you had your monthly energy bill, and you know, it was about 100 euros if you're a tenant, about 150 euros if you're a homeowner, if you have a lot of kids, you're kind of in the age between 35 and 55, it's a little more, one to 65, and Nick takes long showers, so, well, you know, your gas bill goes up. So this was the situation kind of pre-Ukraine invasion, and energy and real estate were not really on your mind. Obviously, that changed kind of in February, March last year. Probably not right away. It only changed when your energy bill or when your energy contract ended and you basically had to pay the new fee. At that point, if you look all the way to the right, it's the average energy bill in the Netherlands. You paid about 600 euros if you're a homeowner and 408 if you're a tenant. Now compare this to the numbers that I showed on mortgage, mortgage payment and rental payments. The average mortgage payment in the Netherlands is 725 euros. The average energy bill these days is 616 euros, so almost on par. The average rent that is being paid in the Netherlands is 610 euros. The average energy bill that is being paid is 408. So you see that energy has become very prominent on every household's budget and the household agenda. The fraction of the energy expenditures to income is currently close to 20%. Uh, you see that that fluctuates again over, over the life cycle, depending on how much you earn and what kind of home you live, but on average, say it's 15 to 20%. So after your <coughs> mortgage or rental payment, this is where you now mostly spend your money. Now, energy is not just related to the energy bill. <coughs> energy is also related to carbon emissions. Given that we uh, use 71% of electricity in buildings, and given that two-thirds of electricity is still generated using uh, fossil fuels, uh, think, for example, about natural gas, think about uh, coal, brown coal in, the, in Germany, or even petroleum, the real estate sector is responsible for about 28% of global carbon emissions. But it doesn't stop there, because buildings also need to be constructed. And for the construction of buildings, you need steel, you need concrete, you need plastic, you need all sorts of material that need energy and does emit carbon to get there. And that's another 11%. So 39% of global carbon emissions in total actually stems from buildings. You hear this number if you're in, in our world very, very opt often, but this is kind of the breakdown. 11% for new construction, 28% for, um, for the operation of homes and the operation of, uh, of commercial buildings. You may say, well, <coughs> carbon emissions, you know, the moment that hits, you know, is, is far away. But of course, there's you, there's your kids, there's your, there's your grandkids. 
carbon emissions, as we by now know, lead to irrevocable climate change. When I first gave talks like these 15 years ago, especially in the US, the other might still have been like, but that, that no longer really happens. Even in the US, I would say in most places, it's now universally accepted that climate change is real and it has devastating effects. Effects like increased precipitation, sea level rise, which is relevant for a country like the Netherlands, but also changing temperatures. Ultimately, this may lead to flooding, as we experienced in Volkenburg two years ago. Wildfires, drought, extreme heat, extreme pollution, things like that. So all elements that will affect you. And I'll talk later on a little bit about how that may affect your financial wealth and, again, your health. Now, real estate may also <coughs> sorry, affect you in a different way. You see, it's all about health, you know. Real estate may also affect you in a different way. And that's because of the fact that you're spending a lot of time indoors. I talked about the piece of real estate where you spend your time today, but think about it. Where do you normally spend your time? Whether it's at home, maybe you spend time in an office. If you're a volunteer at a volunteering facility, you go to a gym that's often indoors. Well, some go for a nice bike ride, many go indoors. You go to a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. There's a great survey in the, in the, in the US, the time of use survey, and they actually ask people to say, okay, where did you spend your time? And if you add it all up, 87% of people's time on average is spent indoors. And that's the cross-section of the population. That's both kids, that's elderly, but it's also people that, uh, people that work, people that also are middle-aged and, and don't work. So 87% of your time is spent indoors. Often we say 90, but the true number here is 86.9. I asked my mother yesterday or the day before yesterday, because she claims that she's a lot outside. And if you really count, I said, mom, how much time did you spend outside? You know, it's kind of hard to spend three hours outside per day. So, you know, 87% is, is not even that strange. <clears throat> now, that wouldn't be a problem if indoor air quality would be great. But the great indoors isn't so great, or at least isn't always so great. Uh, together with, uh, with Juan Palacios, uh, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, we started research on the impact of indoor environments on health was really kind of a branching out from earlier research on energy efficiency. And we started out with, with, with this chart. And what it shows is the percentage of homes in a given country in the European Union that is deficient, and that has deficiencies that may affect your health. Uh, mold, rot, leaking. You would say, well, that's something for uh, yeah, our friends in Italy. Indeed, that's, that's purple, 20 to 25 percent of the homes. That's not something for us. But about 15 percent of the homes in the Netherlands have, leaking, have a leaking roof, have mold, et cetera, et cetera. And Leon and I were walking this morning through a part of Maastricht and said, well, you know, this is probably where that 15%, 15% sits, so it's, so it's real. In Belgium, a little bit of schadenfreude, that percentage is higher. In the Nordics, where I think they've, they've always thought a bit more about indoor air quality, the percentage is, uh, is, is slightly lower. Now, as a next step, we said, well, <clears throat> what does that do ultimately to your health? And we used a set of different measures. So we had self-reported health measures on both physical health and mental health. And we had numbers on actual doctor visits, so objective health measures. What we did is we looked at a German survey, the German socio-economic panel, 25,000 people that we could, or households that we could follow over a period of 25 years. And then we could look at the difference between people actually living in, call it well-maintained homes, and people that were living in homes they were not so well maintained. Now, of course, this is a simple chart, but it controls for everything that we know about people. Their BMI, their income, et cetera, that, that might all be related with, with health. Uh, it's not the full econometric specification, I'll, I'll save you that. But what you see in the red line is that it's always above the blue line. And what that means is that the self-reported health, how people feel, is always better for people that live in homes that are well maintained. Now, the second important fact here is that your physical health is going down about the moment that you're born. Well, I experienced that this week, being in uh, bed with, uh, with some kind of cold or flu, but you know, it's only downhill from here until about 80, well, and then it's kind of towards the over. <coughs> what we also find is that people that live in not so well-maintained homes <coughs> have 11% uh, an 11% higher number of doctor visits. And what that means for a population of 83 million people is a significant higher healthcare outlay or healthcare cost, a demand for healthcare, because homes are not well maintained. And that's just kind of the physical side of things. 
think both Tineke and Meerte and others here will say, well, Niels, it's not just about physical health, it's also about mental health. So the second thing that we looked at is the mental health. Again, <clears throat> it's self-reported metrics of mental health, and the, the news is, is slightly better here. As you get older, your mental health gets better. That's fantastic. There, I think there's a dip at about 45, when, when the kids get really annoying, <clears throat> but afterwards, mom, you're kind of at the top of your mental health, and then also it's, it's slightly going down. <clears throat> but what's important is that mental health, again, continuously uh, exceeds uh, or, or is better for those people living in well-maintained homes as compared to people that live in not so well-maintained homes. And again, this, this difference is, qu is quite significant. And we control for everything we can control for. We did many robustness checks, movers, et cetera, et cetera, that I'll uh, indulge my academic colleagues in if they, uh, if they would like so. So then diving deeper into buildings. This has become my favorite topic. And Jona knows this has become my favorite tool. This is an air quality monitor, a CO2 meter. And Jona knows now that at school he needs to open the window the moment this thing turns red. Now it's currently at uh, 9.34, which is kind of okay. I'll give you a sign, when it, when, or you should give me a sign when it gets too high. What we started to do about five years ago, actually also with, with, uh, with Juan, we started to put sensors in, uh, in primary school classrooms. In effect, we put 300 classrooms across 30 schools in an area called the Oostelijke Mijnstreek. So it's east of here in the area where, where previously uh, we, we had, uh, we had the, mining, uh, the mining activities. We just put those sensors there with the ultimate goal of relating that to learning outcomes. So we put them there, <clears throat> and I know Stan actually is from that area, and I hope Stan, yeah, well, you ended quite well, but you know, that you were in one of those mechanically ventilated schools where it wasn't too cold because what we found, and that's what this picture shows, is that the peak CO2 levels were consistently above the legal threshold. The legal threshold technically for existing buildings is 1200 ppm, parts per million, CO2 parts per million. It's a thousand for, for new buildings, just so that's even below the red line. What we found, and then basically if you go from left to right, you go from cold uh, temperatures to warm temperatures, is that quite consistently, both in mechanically ventilated classrooms, so those are classrooms where there's ventilation in place, as well as in classrooms where you can open the window, that's naturally ventilated, the CO2 levels were way, way too high. So on the right, at the naturally ventilated, well, I think there's one occasion, maybe that's an outlier, where the peak CO2 was below the legal threshold, otherwise always too high. Now, this is not the story of, of the paper, because the story of the paper is that we then related this to learning outcomes. That's why I'm so happy that Stan ended up well, because if you're in a school that has CO2 levels that are above that, that legal threshold, your learning results go down, and they go down substantially. They go down such <clears throat> that I would say high levels of CO2 make you dumber, make you dumb, make you dumber. To quantify that, so currently we're... Uh, at 9.34, so if you add 1,400 to that, so you get to 2,300, which we get to in our classrooms quite a bit, your learning results go down with 20%. But also, and I know some of you are, are getting ready to go to, uh, to high school, again, like, uh, like, like Nick, um, your uh, chance of a HAVO VWO uh, advice, which in the Netherlands is kind of your entry ticket to college or to university, is 30% lower if we again see that increase of 1,400 ppm CO2. So this has real life implications on, well, the career and the human capital accumulation of kids here in the Netherlands, but also broader than that. So if you zoom in a bit on, on, on the results, <clears throat> particularly strong for math, we think that's because yeah, your brains really, really need, need, to, uh, need to work. The, the effect is almost double for young kids. So for, for Josh, who's, uh, well, you know, Josh, what? <laughs> for Josh, it doesn't have an effect, but it has, especially has an effect for kids that are eight or nine or, or 10, 11 years old, so that are a little bigger and probably also emit more CO2. So we, the indoors can have a pretty bad effect on you. But this lecture is not all gonna be about the negative of real estate. Real estate can also be a force for good. Let's start with the environment. <clears throat> so first things first, home insulation. So uh, Pete took the liberty to spend some time uh, on me. I'll take the liberty to spend a little bit of time on Pete. Not so much on Pete, but on the house. We moved back to Maastricht about two and a half years ago, and, uh, and the reason was that, that Pete called us at some point, and we were in the US. Niels, we're gonna move. You once said that um, 
you'd like to uh, buy our house if we uh, move out. So, uh, you know, this is kind of the time. So we ended up buying Pete's house and I bought it and said, what's the energy label? And I expected from my sustainability minded promoter guide in life that this would be an A++ house. <coughs> but first of all, we didn't have an energy label and then the energy label said, uh, G. Well, <laughs> in the Netherlands, A is the highest, G is the lowest. So um, I, um, I got the uh, good old phone book, looked at in the eye of insulation, and I called Maurice van Gennep of Bameco, a local insulation company. And Maurice came by and said, yeah, we're going to fix this, and uh, we're going to insulate this home. It's all going to be great, <clears throat> and it's going to you know, save you a lot of money. It's fantastic. Said, okay, Maurice, yeah, that's great. Said, how do you know? Said, what, what do you mean, how do you know? How do you know that this is you know, going to be a money saver? It's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's like you pay, get this back in like four or five years. It's not a problem. So I challenged Maurice a little bit and uh, I explained what my profession was. And uh, he, he kind of liked it. So I said, okay, you can insulate this house, but I want all of your data. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. But it's still on like those handwritten forms. So we sent the student in. The student copied everything onto the computer. And then we matched every insulation of every home that he ever did until, uh, until 10 years ago or 2009, in fact. And we match that to the microfiles of the Central Bureau of Statistics. And it may scare you a little bit, but what that has on all of you, but every Dutch citizen, is uh, income, age, education, uh, medicine use, uh, not paracetamol, uh, etc. But also your energy consumption, your gas consumption, and your electricity consumption. So that's great, because now we can start to compare homes that were renovated, both pre or renovated, insulated, pre-insulation, post-insulation, and compare it to a set of homes that were never insulated. And this is the picture, picture that basically tells a thousand words. So we take all homes, 2009, 10, 11, and we put them to zero when they were insulated. Well, before they were insulated, basically they're at about that zero line. And then after the insulation, the energy consumption, the gas consumption goes down with about 20% on average. There's some fluctuations over the years, and I showed this for six years, but we have data uh, almost going out 10 years. So what we find is that consistently after insulation, that your consumption of gas goes down with 20%. A bit more if you do the walls, a bit more if you do the roof, a little less if you do the floor. Fairly simple intervention. I'll talk about the economics of that in, uh, in a second. Then commercial real estate, because it's good to talk about your own home, but it's also good to think about investments or uh, or, or collateral of people here in the room. Together with, uh, with Rogier, who made it just in time for, uh, from, uh, from Toronto, uh, we looked at the energy efficiency of commercial buildings. In fact, what we looked at is if you, for example, replace the light bulbs, which you know, we should probably do here at some point as well, uh, that's a very easy energy saver. So if you replace <coughs> in a sample of, uh, of commercial buildings in the US, the lighting, you save on average about 9% in terms of whole building energy consumption. If you replace the HVAC, that's the heating ventilation system, uh, that's almost 10%. And then building controls, it's almost 12%. And building controls, that's so effective because many of the buildings that we looked at were actually being run 24 seven, or they were being cooled and heated at the same time. That's kind of the sorry state of, uh, of energy efficiency in, the, in commercial real estate. So with fairly simple interventions, you can reduce the energy consumption in buildings substantially. Other uh, measures that we looked at were kind of broader metrics from GRASP, from CDP. We also looked at LEED certification, green building certification. And after implementation of such a green building certification, <coughs> energy consumption actually went down with 8%. Now, it's not just about, uh, about energy. It's also about health. And this is an interesting, <coughs> interesting study that we, uh, uh, that we looked at, where we actually looked at the health implications of buildings on people working there. Clearly, I should have worked in a, uh, in a more healthy building. But what we did is in Venlo, the city of Venlo of all places, um, they were building a new, uh, a new municipal building. And they were doing that according to the principles of nature. And you see the building a little bit, a little bit up here. It has a nice green wall, and it actually doesn't have a ventilation system. <clears throat> so the air basically flows in naturally. It flows up and then back through the building. So it has much more airflow in the building and it doesn't use any gas for, uh, for uh, it does use a little bit of gas for heating, but no gas or electricity for, uh, for ventilation. 
We surveyed the people that went into that new building, and sadly for, for some, but they couldn't move. So there was an, uh, a random selection of people, of teams actually, who were taken out of the old building. You see that on the left, it's a bit like our Tapanka Zahana, but 30% of the people were staying behind. And they weren't just like the dummies, but it was a random selection of, uh, of people. So we surveyed all of them before one group moved, and then we surveyed, surveyed three more times. And what we found is that uh, sick building syndromes, dry eyes, dry throat, slight headache after you, you come home from work, it's called sick building syndrome, that those syndromes reduced substantially for those people that moved into the healthy building that had, had much, more, much more fresh air. And when you run a formal analysis, the difference was even 22%. Now, of course, that is a kind of a big intervention to build a new building, but you can see that you can also influence health outcomes through buildings and building designs, building design. Back to schools, what we did there, and this is kind of a lower cost option than constructing a whole building. In fact, I was on a, on a school meeting uh, earlier, uh, earlier this week, and everybody, everybody was complaining, saying, well, we just can't build a new school, and how can we just reduce the CO2 level indoors? So it's either our study has had an impact or people are really annoyed by, by, uh, by those CO2 sensors that they have in their classrooms now. What we looked at together with Xudong, uh, Xudong Sun, PhD student, is the impact of a behavioral change. So with lockdown, which, um, well, which you kind of still vaguely remember, the kids were at home, the schools were closed. It's kind of uh, an interesting time to, uh, to say the least. Um, but after the lockdown, there was a, a change in the ventilation protocol. So believe it or not, but before the lockdown, windows and classrooms were not open a lot, but also the concierges, kind of the engineering guys in the schools, they were typically not running the mechanical ventilation at full steam. So well, yeah, it's costly, you know, we kind of switch it on, switch it off, we run it at 50%. <clears throat> but after COVID, they had to run it at 100%, at least when the classrooms were open, and the, window, or the windows had to be opened. So yes, it's cold, we got we to gotta open the windows. So on the left, you see uh, mechanical ventilation in orange, and on the right, you see natural ventilation in orange. You see kind of the average levels of CO2 in classrooms before corona. Then the kids came back in with the mechanical ventilation system full on, using more energy. And actually what happened is that CO2 levels decreased substantially. Still, they were very close to that legal threshold of 1200, but now they're actually below it. For naturally ventilated rooms, the difference was, I would say, quite remarkable. Average CO2 levels went down with 600 ppm, which is an increase in test scores of 7%. Hey, that's interesting. So we did something which is purely behavioral, opening the windows. We lowered CO2 levels, maybe you know, increased the incidence of colds in kids a little, a little bit. But then at the same time, we threw that improved the learning outcomes or human capital accumulation. So that's um, two birds with, uh, with one stone, and it's almost free. Now, what's important is that you can do well by doing good, which is the title of, of one of my papers a, lo a long time ago, 15 years ago. So normally when you look at an investment, you look at that through a finance lens and you use the simple formula. So this is what we teach our finance, uh, finance students in the first year. So I think I can explain it to you if, if you like, what, what is this? The I is the investment that you make in energy efficiency. Say you put solar panels on the roof, it will cost you 10,000 euros. The CF is the cash flows. It's the annual cash flow that you get from that solar panel. Let's say you know, it, it yields 1,000 euros per year in terms of uh, electricity and those energy savings. So you have those over a number of years. But of course, the cash flows next year, the cash flows in 10 years, are not worth the same as the cash flow today. Imagine they have 10 euros today. Well, 10 euros in 10 years are worth less because of inflation, right? So you got to bring this back with what your return expectation is on, on money. So your return expectation probably currently, you, know, you put it at the bank, 1%. You invest it, maybe 5 6%. So you discount all of the cash flows back with your return expectation, which let's say is 6%. And then you compare the present value of all the future cash flows with the investment. If that's positive, it's a good investment. I probably lost uh, some of you halfway, but that's the simple finance framework. <laughs> finance 101. Always happy to teach you here at Maastricht. So let's go back to, uh, so let's go back to home installation. A lot of numbers on this slide, but just focus on the first column. It's all types of installations combined. The average investment is 1,640 euro, and I would say that's not a lot of money. 
and it's before subsidies. Currently, you can get subsidies worth up to, I would say, for 1,640 euros, about 1,000 euros. So it would actually only cost you 640 euros. The yearly savings that we found in our study, if you look at the average, about 300 euros per year. So the annual, the simple annual return, if you assume this goes on forever and it's capitalized into home values, is 18.3%. <clears throat> now look all the way on the right. These are the average annual returns on all different types of assets. Stocks, 8%. Infrastructure, 10%. Real estate, 7.7%. Private equity, 12.6%. Hedge funds, super sexy, 4.2%. So basically, home insulation beats everything. And put your money in the spouwmuur. Put your, yeah, that's, I think, what they say. <laughs> Stop your spaargeld in the spouwmuur. Now, what's interesting, if you look at 2022 prices. So we asked Maurice of Bameco, is it, well, Maurice, Tell us in all honesty, did you increase your prices because demand has gone up so much? It's like, well, yeah, okay, you got me. So uh, if you would do the same insulation now, it's about 2,000 euros. Of course, there's inflation, but of course, Maurice also has a lot of demand. So then you can just increase prices a little bit. That's what you learn, right, as an economist. So if you then also take current electricity prices and current gas prices, which, which are most important, yearly savings are 866 euros. The investment is about 2,000, so also went up by a quarter. And the annual return is now 42%, payback period of 2.4 years. So Maurice was right. Maurice was totally right when he said to me, you know, you're going to earn this back in about five years. In the old situation, it was 5.5. In a new situation, it's even 2.4 years. So it's a great investment. What about the return to green building? Well, that's a little harder to capture. And it's great to see Guus, uh, Guus Berg out here because he's been with me on, uh, on, uh, on, on this journey for, for a long time. Um, but we try to, to get to the cost of green building, and it's hard because, well, how can you tease out which part of a building is green, which part is not? Well, the solar panels, that's easy. But, well, the extra insulation, well, how much was the extra cost? So together with Andrea Shegut, we did a study. And um, I have to say, I have to memorize Andrea here because she was my first PhD student and she passed away a couple of months ago uh, from, a, from a tumor, which is extremely sad. We were about the same age and she's leaving behind a family and, and I think a great legacy. And part of that legacy is this paper because it's still the first and the only paper I think that looks at the cost of green building. And what we did is we went to all commercial building projects in the UK. Um, I think there were a couple of students involved in teasing that data out. And then we said, well, can we compare green buildings to non-green buildings, controlling everything uh, that, that, that for everything that we know? And what we found is that on average, the cost difference between a green and a non-green building was about 7%. And that cost was mostly in the design stage. That's problematic because that's when developers still pay the bill. Uh, and, and the problem was also, or the problem, the issue was also that those projects lasted about 11% or a year longer to construct. That's also kind of an issue because as a developer, you want to sell your building and get your money out, right? So unless you forward sale it, that 11 months is not something that you, uh, that you like. So think about that 7%. Then we look at kind of the benefit side of green building in the market. Well, that's research that um, if you were here 15 years ago, you've heard before. So I'll refresh your memory. Uh, together with John Quickly and, uh, and, and Pete, we looked at the effects of green building in the marketplace. And we looked at rents, at cash flows. We also looked at transaction prices. We did that in 2010. We again did it in 2013. And then together with Rogier, we kind of closed the, uh, the, the trilogy in 2019 with a third and what I think is the last study. Um, and what we found in those studies, and the numbers differed a little bit over time, but kind of rain or shine, crisis or, or, uh, or no crisis, rents and green buildings were higher by about 3%, cash flows higher by about 7%, and prices higher by about 13%. So simply compared to 13 to the 7, you would say, well, as a developer, if you put 7% more in, you get 13% more out. Well, you know, that's an MPV positive investment. Now... One more thing on, uh, on the energy efficiency side on homes more broadly. <clears throat> I had to put this in because Dirk and I have been working together also for quite a long time. And I remember Dirk was here and I said, Dirk, I have a great idea. He's like, mm, uh, where are you? But ultimately, he's laughing, but that's what she thought. But we started working together and we did a paper on the effect of energy labels on home prices. And we said, well, if a home has a higher energy label, is that reflected in prices? And this is kind of the picture that came out. If you take D as the reference, what you see is that G-labeled homes sell at about a 5% discount, and that A-labeled homes sell at a 10% premium. 
Now, we have been talking about this, well, <clears throat> for about 12 years now. We've been talking about it with realtors, with appraisers, with, 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 with makelaars, and they would always say, well, I don't know. I don't see it in the market. I don't know. So my mother recently bought a new home, so we again talked to realtors. And you know the, 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 the saying in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. Well, he didn't even want to talk about location. The only thing was, well, if you think about energy efficiency, you could do solar panels here. You could do like a, a ground source heat pump and floor heating. So it seems like energy efficiency is now the new location, location, location. And it should be <clears throat> because if you compare the benefits to the cost, it's a no-brainer. That's what I try to convince my mother of. Um, so the cost of improving a home is estimated to be at about 4,000 euros per label. So if you want to go from G to D, for example, it will cost you about 16,000 euros. So think about solar panels, think about a heat pump, think about insulation, you now know what that costs. You can really nicely compare that to the benefit when you sell your home. And the benefit is now there, the realtors, they believe it, and if they believe it, it's, it's, it's definitely true. So compare that 16,000 cost premium of greening a home from G to D, with the benefit, or G to C, sorry, 16,000 of G to C, the benefit of 29,000, and even ignoring the energy savings, you should do this for your own wallet and your own comfort. So that's all about energy efficiency, but investing in health also yields a return. <clears throat> so this pretty, bit, uh, pr pretty building in Venlo, the marginal investment, so the cost to get it there was 3.4 million. And what's interesting is that the cost of that building initially was about 50 million. Take 7%, Andreas 7%, well, 7% times 50 million, that's an easy one, that's 3.5, 3.4 million. So that 7% doesn't seem to be a very strange number. That was the marginal investment to get that building to be healthy and green. Now, the marginal benefit, <coughs> first of all, was in the fact that there's no HVAC system, so there's no maintenance, but there's also no cost for running a ventilation uh, and, uh, and cooling system. And that, the city of Venlo claims, saved them 17 million. Well, 17 compared to 3.4, no-brainer. What we found, though, in addition to this decreased sick building syndrome, which you could say, well, you know, congratulations, is that sick leave of the 800 employees for the municipality of Venlo also went down at about 2%. Now, consider the fact that the city of Venlo spends 55 million euros per year on labor, and you can reduce sick leave with 2%, that's a substantial gain. And we, uh, we estimate that gain to be about 2.5 million. That's probably a conservative estimate, but it's additional to the savings that they already have on their gas, uh, electricity, and other costs. So, well, that's all great, but why aren't all buildings healthy and green? It's too long. Is that a signal? I don't know. <clears throat> so why aren't all buildings healthy and green? Well, it's very simple. Buildings are durable goods. So I said this uh, this week uh, to um, <clears throat> to Leon, it's not like iPads in our households, you know, you replace them about every month. Sometimes if you're lucky, about every six months. Buildings are there for a long time. If it still works, yep. It's a picture of, uh, of uh, Maastricht again. And red is old and blue is relatively new. Uh, so for those of you that know Maastricht, you kind of know that we are there in the Binnenstad, inner city. Over there is Ceramiek in the blue. That's a relatively recent addition. But most of Maastricht is old. And that's like, like all of our building stock. We have a durable building stock, and it's quite old. It's also depicted in, uh, in, uh, in this chart. These are all of the homes in the Netherlands, but then plotted when they were constructed, which cohort. And what you see is that what we constructed after 2015, of course, the, the decade is not yet over, is a relatively small piece. We constructed about 600,000 homes between 2005 and 2015. That's 60,000 homes per year. Our goal is 100,000. We'll never get there. But even if we got there, it would take a long time to replenish the 8 million homes <coughs> that we have in the Netherlands. Most of the homes that we have are 50 years or older. And homes that are 50 years or older probably need money and capital to be improved. Not those pretty jaren 30 huizen, uh, Gijs, Claire, Ronald, Babette, everybody did their part in Utrecht to make those pretty again. So those are all probably pretty well insulated with nice solar panels, but everything that's not a jaren 30 huizen in the hands of yuppies and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, couples with young kids before they kind of almost have to move out. 
because the, the home gets too small, needs to be needs to be renovated, especially that cohort 75 to 85. You also see this reflected uh, when you look at the building stock from an energy label perspective. So first of all, about 45% of, uh, of the Dutch building stock doesn't have an energy label, 42% to be precise, so we assume that to be inefficient. But then on the right, 2022, when you look at the fraction of homes that has a green energy label, A, B, or C, <clears throat> that's also less than 50%. And I consider A, B, or C kind of where we need to be, and uh, probably we need to be more at A rather than at C. So what do we need to do to get the building stock all to ABC and to get to net zero? That's a big task. So I have a couple of ideas. First of all, we need information provision. And I've always been a fan of information provision. A lot of my research has been based on information provision, it has been based on energy labels, on green certification, et cetera, et cetera. That's what you see on the left. One problem with the energy label as we know it is that it's design-based benchmarking. So we basically say, well, <clears throat> this home is label A, so it will be efficient and it won't use a lot of energy. But what we know from research is that if I give you an efficient car, you probably drive a little more, you may drive a little faster. And if I give you an inefficient car, you think, well, you know, if I don't use it so much or if I drive a little slower, I might use less. So inefficient homes use less energy than expected and efficient homes use more energy than expected. So what we need to do is we need to go to performance-based benchmarking or EUI-based benchmarking, and that's energy use intensity. How much does this building actually use divided by square meters, the number of people, depending on the kind of building that it is. And that actually exists. It exists in the place where you would least uh, expect it in the United States with Energy Star. It exists in Australia and it exists in the UK under the name of Neighbors. And what they do there is they compare buildings and say, okay, how many kilowatt hours per square meter do you use? And how does that compare to the average? That's a lot or it's not a lot. And based on that, they make regulation and they put a tax into place. We also put regulation into place. And to some extent, you know, typically economists don't like regulation unless they're market failures. I think the built environment can use a little bit of regulation, a little bit. When it comes to energy labels, I already see uh, Edo saying no more regulation, but a little bit of regulation for energy efficiency is good. And what the Dutch government did based on the energy label, not based on a performance-based label saying, if you're less than label C as an office building, you can no longer be leased out, transact or be financed by January 1st, 2023. That was last month. We'll see how strongly that is enforced, <clears throat> who knows? But that's the regulation now in the Netherlands. In the UK, that regulation bites um, starting at level E. So you need to have a minimum of E. Of course, the question is, why just for office buildings? Why not for retail or logistics or apartment buildings? What happens uh, next is C kind of where we end, or are we putting the level to A in 2030? So what we need is forward-looking regulation that gives clarity to the market, and then the market can adhere to that. And ideally, it's based on performance measures. The same, of course, holds for indoor air quality. On the left, you see <clears throat> how indoor air quality requirements are currently spe specified. I'm not an engineer, so don't fully understand it, but it probably says this is the amount of fresh air you need to pump into a contour, uh, a winkel, sports facility. Um, but then the only thing that matters is what you see on the right. How does that space actually perform? So it's about time that we start enforcing based on what we see on this meter. 953, you can all stay seated. Life is still good. And so a question recently, uh, I think it was on Eén Vandaag, was should we close schools if air quality is like this? And quite honestly, you know, I don't want to have my kids at home, but you know, probably you should really start to think about that. Next stop, capital. Regulation alone is not going to solve the problem. It's some, sometimes something that we think in the, in the Netherlands that if we regulate more that we solve the housing crisis. Same for energy efficiency, that's not going to work. Uh, the Dutch Central Bank, DNB, estimates we need about 200 billion to bring the Dutch building stock, the total building stock, to net zero. That is off natural gas. About 100 billion of that is needed for homes, <clears throat> and then the rest of that is needed for uh, apartments, for uh, social housing. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> We've done this so often, yeah. <laughs> for social housing, for commercial buildings. It's about 200 billion. 
That's a scenario where everybody goes to a heat pump. That's a scenario where every home is insulated. So that's a lot of business for Maurice at Bameco. Uh, it's a situation where we have solar to actually uh, power all of the heat pumps. In the situation of green gas, we would need less, but green gas, I think, is, uh, is still very, very far away. So 200 billion is a lot of money. Yes, our pension funds in the Netherlands have about 1,500 billion in store, but about 150 of that is already invested in real estate. And I don't think the pension funds are ready to put 200 billion in BV Nederland, or at least in the energy efficiency of the building stock. So <clears throat> capital provision will have to come from banks and will have to come from other places. Now that's relatively complex. On the one hand, if you think about your own home, <clears throat> your bank could stand up and say, hey, you know, I'm ABN AMRO, I'm ING, I'm Rabobank, <clears throat> you financed your home here, can I help you with another 9,000 to make it green? And basically expand your existing mortgage contract. That's not too complicated. At your own home, your own investment, your own savings. Quite easy. As long as you do everything that has a savings to cost ratio, <clears throat> which is higher than one, life is good. Mm. Now the problem comes in when you look at people that own their own home, but have payment problems. Well, those people typically also have the homes that are least well maintained, that are not so well insulated, don't have solar panels. Next time, walk on the street <coughs> and look up. You'll see a roof and another roof and another roof. One has solar panels, the second has solar panels. About one out of every 10 homes has solar panels now. Why doesn't the third home have solar panels? Well, maybe the people that live there can't afford it. As an example, how we not deal with this is that uh, the province of Limburg has the Duurzaam Thuisregeling. I'm seeing whether I see Paul, my friend here. So it's a great, it's, it's a great uh, uh, piece of, uh, of work and you can get money to green your home. Fantastic. Of course, you need to be clean from a credit perspective. If you have a BKR, that's a kind of a credit registration, you cannot get financing through the Duurzaam Thuisregeling. And guess what? They've basically given away all of their money while it's a loan. <clears throat> they don't have a single payment issue because there's not a single payment that, or a single person that applied to it that really needed it. So we need to get money to those homeowners that really need it. So we got to think about <clears throat> a fund there where the government steps in with a first loss piece. So basically the government would take that first loss and then commercial lenders or investors can, can pick up the rest. Then the rental homes and apartment buildings, commercial buildings, that's a bit more complex. And why? Because there's a split incentive issue. If I own a building and you're the tenant, I invest and you have the savings. You know, that's not a situation where I, as a landlord, am like super incentivized to invest in the building. So we don't just regulation for the owner, but we also need regulation that allows the owner to increase the service charge on the tenant when they improve the building. They should improve the building demonstrably, yeah, for example, through what I call an ex post assessment of energy efficiency or smart metering. They should show that the savings to cost ratio is higher than one and then be allowed to actually put the initial investment onto the tenant <coughs> so they can recoup their investment. And then you got to get to the financing part. Not a problem for the average commercial building. Um, I've been pleased to see that the notion of a mortgage top up is, is really embraced by, by the commercial banks. And again, uh, ING Real Estate Finance has been one of the leaders in that space. I already have a mortgage from you or by you. I'll give you some more. The problem is with the housing corporations, again, the people that need it most, the people of 67 plus that now pay 400 euros in rent and 600 euros in energy, and also the VVAs. Those are the apartment owners that live under the same roof, but that don't agree on anything. Typically, they also don't have a lot of money in their, uh, in their VVA. So they all look at each other and say, well, we got to do something in this building, but well, we don't have money, we don't agree, so let's not do it. So we got to think about a way that we can finance VVAs or condo owners to start working, working together. And the financing there could also be collateralized by the individual apartments in the, uh, in the building. So we see a lot of opportunities there for new products and the government shouldn't step in there basically with subsidies, et cetera, but really to be a, a taker of, uh, of, uh, of first loss. So that's the government support that we need. And then equity. <clears throat> I know there's, there's a couple of people from pension funds here in the room and I know that pension funds are very eager to get into the BV Nederland into energy efficiency. But how? We need scale and we need product. Well, product, the EU recently uh, released its SFDR, the Social Finance uh, Regulation Directive, and they classified uh, funds now under Article 9, 8, or 7. 
Seven, you're kind of a loser, you're kind of average. Eight, you're light green. <clears throat> and nine, you're deep green. The problem with deep green is you can only be deep green as a fund if all of the real estate in there is green. So if I invest in the property in what I call a brown to green strategy, and I take something from where it needs love, label G, to label A, it can no longer be in an Article 9 fund. And the beauty of those Article 9 funds is that APG, PGGM, and their, their underlying pension funds, <clears throat> they all have capital set aside to invest in these, in these products. So if you can offer an Article 9 fund to the market, you really start to funnel, funnel pension fund money into the place where it's needed most. And part of that could, for example, be an energy efficiency fund for the commercial real estate market, or maybe for VVAs. I put GRASP in there, I had to mention it somewhere because it was such an important part, at least of, of, uh, of my professional career, but maybe also academic career, uh, given the small GRASP fund that we, that we funded out of it, it actually pays part of my professorship. So uh, yeah, that's good to have it in here. But um, GRASP has really moved on when I started it from kind of what's your policy, what's your strategy, do you have a head of sustainability, to what is the actual energy use intensity of buildings in your portfolio. And that's something that you could, again, tie to financing as well. Well, what about subsidies? Uh, Adrian, my friend, sent me an article earlier this week in the NSA about um, the current debate on, uh, on net metering, on terugleveren of, of, of solar energy. And it's, of course, a hot debate. Well, solar is now so effective that at some point, yeah, we should basically say we should stop with subsidizing solar. But at the same time, we should start subsidizing the day-night intermittency and, and the way to solve that, which is batteries. If we take away the subsidy of bringing energy back to the grid, you need a battery such that you can save your energy during the day and using at night. Belgium has been subsidi subsidizing batteries for a long time. The Netherlands, you know, we're still with our head in the sand. We're subsidizing insulation because the payback period is only two and a half uh, is only two and a half years. So you see currently in the Netherlands that the subsidies are really kind of focused on the late <clears throat> on the late majority, the people really that I think don't need it, including myself, and they're not focused on the part of the market, the leading edge and the bleeding edge where we do need it. So think about still think about window replacement. That's kind of from a finance perspective inefficient, but also think about heat pumps, think about uh, battery storage, and kind of more advanced advanced uh, things like demand response. Well, you know the the OPET will come after today. Uh, I promise, Adrian. So what will the future bring? If we follow all of these recommendations, life will be good. The future has already arrived. And the future arrived last year. Uh, for a very long time, we've had a flat energy price of about 20 cents per kilowatt hour. And like I showed at the beginning, if you own a home, about 150, maybe with kids, 200 euros per month. If you rent a place, 80 to 100 euros per month. You know, it's money, but it's not that substantial. That stopped last year when prices basically quadrupled and more. And uh, for many of you, when your energy contract reset, including my, uh, my, my dear parents-in-law, you look at it, you're like, wow, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is real money. If we go from 200 to, uh, to 800, I'm speaking, I'm speaking for myself now. Of course, the government has stepped in with a price cap. Uh, the price of electricity is now capped at 40 cents. That will cost the Dutch government 13 billion in 2023 alone. Think about 13 billion. You could put solar panels on 1.3 million homes. You could put solar panels on 1.3 million homes of people that really need it. Rather than a price cap that is so widespread that we can't maintain in the long run. 2024, prices are gonna be you know, not at 20 cents. They're gonna be at 40, at 60. They're gonna be fluctuating. And your energy bill is gonna be much higher than it ever was. That's the new reality that we, uh, <clears throat> that we have to deal with. So. The fundamentals have shifted and they will stay different. What that means in the housing market is that the bifurcation that we currently already see, the haves and the have-nots, the A labels, the B labels versus the G labels, that that will persist. Um, and so if you take the data from Dirk and myself, and we, Dirk, we got, or you got, because you continued our study to a price difference of about 25,000 euros uh, between label G and label C, that price difference, and this has now been picked up by the NVM itself, by the brokers themselves, um, have, has now increased to 35,000 euros. So as Professor Kudai would say, Professor Kudai, oh no. 
You ain't seen nothing yet. The green revolution has arrived on the housing market. You would probably say that, but you, you would say you ain't seen nothing yet. So what about the commercial real estate market? <clears throat> well, I haven't really talked about basically work from home, etc., and and the shift really that we've seen in, in commercial real estate. But I wanted to say something about that briefly before my voice totally collapses. <clears throat> so this is a very interesting chart. It's the Castle Back to Work Barometer. It's for the US. I'll give you a second to digest it. And what it shows, when you enter an office in the US, <clears throat> you always have to cross like a turnstile. So you have to swipe a card or you have to go to reception and they kind of swipe you through. And those turnstile, uh, those turnstile counts, they're basically aggregated. And that's what Castle, what Castle does. They own the turnstiles. And what they said, well, before Corona, we were basically at 100%. And then, of course, when Corona hit, everybody stayed at home and office occupancy went to about 0% in New York. Of course, in Texas, there was you know, no Corona, so it was 20%, still people stayed at home. And then afterwards, occupancy came back, but it only came back to about 50%. It's really, I mean, if, if you like real estate, you've never seen that, go to the Castle website. They publish this on a weekly basis. You see that which days are really empty, which days are really full. But we're at about 50% right now. Now, that doesn't mean that the occupancy rate in the commercial office market all of a sudden is 50%. Because companies have leases and leases run for five, six, seven years. But there comes a point when the lease runs out. And then a company will evaluate and will say, well, do I really need the 10, 20, 100,000 square meters that I currently have? Or do I need you know, maybe 70% of that or 60% of that? So at the extensive margin, it's kind of a real economist term, but in terms of how much space we need, it's pretty sure that we don't need as much space as that we currently have. In terms of the intensive margin, the kind of space that we need, we, we know what we want. We want green space. We want healthy space. Case. Uh, we, uh, we've toured many edge buildings over the years. This is the edge building in, uh, in, uh, in Sloteldijk. So it's an, uh, it's an old building that, that has been fully renovated. <clears throat> in the past, the, the indoors here was just a place where the, uh, where the mechanics could smoke their cigarette. Now it has been really been, uh, been topped off. It's an atrium. You can have a coffee. You can basically take the stairs rather than take the elevator. It's a fantastic office just to be in, even though it's a slow to dike. Um, it's a fantastic office to be in. Uh, and most of all, it's fantastically led and had, it has been fantastically sold right on time. So this is the kind of building that is the building of the future. Now, I would say, you know, we knew that a long time ago, kind of as of uh, 2007, but the world has woken up at last. I was so excited to pick up The Economist two, three weeks ago. Kind of The Economist is kind of my Bible and to see the word green building, and I kept on reading. I didn't see Niels Kok, I didn't see Pete Eichholz. It will come at some point, but it did say, green buildings are increasingly popular. If The Economist says it, it's true. CNBC said green offices in London are over 25% more expensive, but the modern workforce now expects it. So also in the commercial real estate space, the green revolution has arrived. But has it arrived in time? That's the question. Ben bijna klaar, Piet. Has it arrived in time? And we do all of it, or a lot of this, certainly from an energy efficiency perspective, <clears throat> to basically reduce the lethal threat of climate change, reduce emissions, hopefully slow down global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think we're, at the end of the day, too late. And we see increasing flood. We see increasing hurricanes. We've seen Volkenberg flooding, which is something that, uh, that didn't happen before, or it happened before, but not at the same scale. So what we're now focused on in terms of research and what we will be focusing on for the next decade is the impact of climate change and climate change events on the commercial real estate sector as well as your own home. The impact on home prices or rents, whether banks are still willing to finance and at what, what cost, whether insurance companies will stay or go away, but also whether buildings can protect you from climate change. So can the building be a shelter? And if one building is and the other is not, are tenants going to make a choice based on the ability to, to shield them from, for example, heat waves? So that's the future. People, planet, property, how buildings shape the environment, your health, and your wealth. Give me one more second, Pete, because I also want to thank you. Go on. Yeah. 
Now, as Ed, there's too many people uh, to thank. I made a quick wordle of, of, uh, of, 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 of the papers in, in my resume, but of course want to thank my collaborators, my co-authors, and most of all, uh, my friends in, uh, in academia for working together. It's been a great journey, and it will be a great journey going forward. So Pete, don't retire just yet. Leon thought I wouldn't thank her, but of course, thank you, Leon, and thank you, Jules and Jonah and Joshua. Yeah for your friendship. We had a great time together in the US and we're super happy to be here in Maastricht and we're not gonna, gonna, uh, gonna go anywhere soon. And with that, ik heb gezegd. That was a great talk, Niels. Really, really nice. A bit too long, well. Huh? And, and I, I had been signaling you for 10 minutes. You, you completely ignored me. But, you know, uh, that's, that's our current relationship. Now, thanks for exposing the, the dire state of insulation in my old home. The only reason that I didn't do it was that I, would, I knew you guys would buy it and that you would then do everything over again anyway. But in my current home, the situation is, of course, much better. As you know, it's not actually, but um, <laughs> we're working on it. I promise you, and I think I'm going to beat your mother in, in making it energy efficient. So um, what I learned also is that we just spent 5.4% of our time at work. I was just doing some calculations. That means 9 to 10 hours a week. Wow. Well, I know Neil spends more time at work than 9 to, hour, 9 to 10 hours a week. And, uh, and that's good. And another key message here is that the world is really improving. And what I also like, has, so, so you, hear, you heard Niels talking about health and energy efficiency, and you think, wait, 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 wait. This guy is accepti accepting a position as a real estate finance professor. Where's the finance? Where's the investment? It's all about health and CO2 and CO2 metering. And what's the finance? So I'm really happy that in the end, you took it back to financing it because in the end, it is all a big financing challenge. And that's why you really deserve this, this position. And in the building today, I found these little bracelets that the, that the labor union is distributing. And it says, meer vaste contracten nu. Niels, you earn your vaste contract. <laughs> okay. Now let's go back to housekeeping. We're going to leave this, uh, this, this room. The, the professors, so that's the folks in these robes, they're gonna go through that door. You can choose any door you want. Um, it is protocol that the professors then go stand in a line and congratulate Niels, but it's not protocol that you do that too. There is no official reception line. So don't go stand in a line and because Niels can't talk anyway. You know, he spent all his voice on, on this talk. So the professors are going to congratulate Niels and everybody else. I think Niels and Leon are already very happy that you spent 200, uh, that you drove 200 kilometers to get here. That is enough. Then if you see Niels standing on his own, you can congratulate him, but don't make a line, right? Because it's very cold in the corridor. It's unhealthy, too much CO2 dead ventilation so let's do that let's go out there and uh, and have fun okay <laughs>